I got another email. Would you like to hear that one? I'd like to hear this jazz, yeah. Well, it is it's it is all that jazz. This is from Mark Cole. He's contributed some questions before from Odessa Steps Magazine. And Jim and Brian, see, apparently the, the punitive action that the writers have been taking on you lately to not even acknowledge you in the salutation of these uh, self-same aforesaid and mentioned letters has... The pithiness with which you reacted to it has suitably chastened some of these people. There was a lot of words you don't hear on most podcasts. It's all strung together, right? Jim and Brian, while I normally loathe fantasy booking, young Cody introducing this bit of history does make you want to play the historical what-if game. If Dusty Rhodes had beaten superstar Billy Graham in the garden to become Vince Sr.'s world champion, Just how many ways does that change wrestling history? No Backland as champion, or at least no six-year reign? What happens to Eddie Graham's Florida with no Dusty? Or, given Eddie's relationship with Vince, does Dusty still work Florida on a sporadic basis? And what would that do to Eddie's relationship with the NWA? Presuming he doesn't hold the belt forever, does Dusty still get the NWA title runs in the early 80s? There are so many permutations, is another word I love, but I'd be interested in hearing your thought exercise on the topic. So what do you think, Brian? What if they hadn't taken the title away from my daddy in the garden? I think it's a great topic, a great question, and I'm going to throw this out there at the beginning because I saw this not too long ago, and I have to ask him about it. He was just out here. Brian Solomon tweeted not too long ago, I believe... What he tweeted was he heard it from the horse's mouth. And I was thinking the horse may have been Vince McMahon because he used to work for WWE magazine back in the day in Titan Tower. That if it wasn't Hogan, Vince would have gone with Dusty. And I thought that was so intriguing to know that that's one of those names that everyone always figured. Yeah. But we never actually heard. Yeah, Vince would have done that. It would have been Dusty at that time. So we go back now to. 77. And Dusty gets over super big in the garden and on their TV. And Vince is at ringside watching that whole time. And we know that he says now he didn't want the title off Billy Graham. And we could see now the reasons why he would think that, although at the time it it made more sense than it does now. But imagine if he was pushing Dusty Rhodes to his dad then. I know you want to go with Backlund because Backlund was, even though he had no ethnicity really he was like johnny carson you know you know it was like we had the uh latino we had the italian and now we have what you know know, what are you uh instead of back when if they went with dusty that would have been the time for the change because he knew he was going to bring back one and have him win the belt by the time billy graham got the belt yes so the plan would have had to have changed in those months well and see this may be an early example of another person besides Tony Khan deciding to go through with a previously decided upon plan despite seeing something better kind of dangling in front of him. But there there were other issues then that Dusty was a big deal for Eddie Graham in Florida. And also, you know, I mean, obviously Dusty, if offered, would have taken the WWF champion or WWWF championship, but there were other considerations at that point. But I think now does everybody know the story or is this an old story now that some of the new folks haven't been apprised of the decision on Bob Backlund, like you said, was made by the time that superstar Billy Graham won the world title from Bruno, what, 14, 15 months earlier. Yeah, 76. Because, and I've got, uh, I mean, uh, and again, I forget how much of this story is widely known and how much it's just because I've talked to people. I've talked to Kevin Sullivan about the Florida situation and and, uh, involvement in this. And it was well known in some cases back at that time in the business, but, and then there was the WWF rumors. But basically, Vince Sr., after Pedro, because Pedro had drawn well in the garden 
but didn't draw quite as well as Bruno had in a lot of the outlying towns, Boston, Philly, whatever, but also there was the problem with violence with Pedro because Mulligan in Boston had gotten cut, stabbed uh, that time badly against Pedro. They couldn't possibly beat Pedro Morales just blatantly flat out or especially fuck him in the garden. It would cause a riot. So that whole thing, they had agreed or he, Vince Sr. had gotten Bruno to agree to come back and take the belt in at the end of 73. And they did this transitional switch from Pedro through Stan Stajak for 10 days and into Bruno. And then, again, Bruno had gotten the one of the most lucrative deals ever given any wrestler in the business to actual actual percentages of the biggest towns in the business to come back and do that. And he drew again, set record houses. Bigger. He was bigger in that second well, run. Yeah, really, bigger because they had, they had bigger buildings and better TV. And better TV. That was a big yeah. part of it. So, but then by the time that, again, he said, I, you know, after Hanson had broke his neck and, you know, the schedule is grinding on him, he says, I've got to be out. That's when Vince Sr. decided for the first time in the in modern wrestling in New York and maybe really ever to have a non-ethnic hero because who was the uh, I mean Londos was Greek in the 30s Rocca was Argentinian slash Italian in the 50s Pedro a Puerto Rican Hispanic Bruno Italian so there was never really an all-American boy on top in New York and uh, we've talked about the problems with the starting in the 1930s with all the English English language newspapers in New York doing the exposés. And then you go back and look after the dark period in the 40s when wrestling came back in the 50s. It was brutal press coverage still because they still had a hard on for wrestling in, in the Big Apple. The newspaper our, uh, uh, reporters did and newspapers. So. The the crowds that came, besides the, you know, hardcore wrestling fan, it was, you know, of American descent, but the crowds came to see Rocca and Perez and Bruno, their, their heroes, and they weren't getting, in their language, newspapers and radio stations in New York called suckers and idiots for believing this fake phony bullshit. But finally... He wants an all-American boy in 1976 when Bruno says, I got to, I got to get rid of this thing. And at that point, he called a number of promoters. And one of them that he called was Eddie Graham because Eddie Graham had had so much success with Jack Briscoe just a few years previously, former NCAA heavyweight champion as all-American boy as you can get was NWA champion for three plus years, drew some of the biggest gates they ever had. And Eddie Graham had been his mentor and the guy that broke him in and, and raised him. So. And Vince Sr. had a good relationship with Eddie Graham to the point where he even allowed his TV to air in New York. Exactly. Because the Graham brothers and specifically Eddie, while Dr. Jerry had been Vince Jr.'s favorite wrestler, he was a nightmare for the promoters to deal with. But Eddie Graham his brother, Vince Sr.'s other Golden Graham, ends up going south to Florida, buying into the promotion, becoming one of the most respected bookers and Finnish men in the business and a mover and shaker in the NWA. And remember, in the 70s, Vince Sr. had rejoined the NWA. He was a member. And he had a place in Florida. And he had a place in Florida. And that's where and Willie Gilsenberg did, too. And... You know, we, there was a pipeline between the New York and Florida offices, even though they were technically separate promotional umbrellas. So that's when Bob Backlund was pitched. And I th actually, I think Eddie Graham may have pitched Steve Kern first or tried to. That's what I've heard. I always heard it was yeah. one or the other. Pick one. Well... I think he, he may have tried to pitch him because Kern was in the, you know, figured in in Florida at the time in the family and one of the protégés, but I I don't think that Vince Sr. would have seen him as future WWF champion material. But 
Remember what Backlund was a another NCAA wrestling champion, but Division two, but still he was a, a not only a shooter, but his athletic credentials were incredible. And the the whole workout thing with Bob and the running the steps and the free squats and the whole nine yards that he continues to do, I guess, to this day, that's why he looks so great at his age. Nobody was ever in better cardio condition. And when Orndorf was breaking in in Florida at that same time, one of the tapes they sent to Tennessee when when Paul Orndorf came in as a rookie and they they Jerry Jarrett did the favor for Eddie Graham of giving him some experience on top. They showed Orndorf and Bob Backlund training calisthenics in the gym and doing the shit where they're doing they're doing neck bridges with their legs interlocked and then doing sit-ups in that position and just this crazy shit. And so Backlund, he's a shooter, he's a young guy, he's an all-American boy. He's got the athletic credentials. All we got to do is teach him how to work, right? And that's why in 1976 and 77, he went to St. Louis. He was featured there. He was featured some on Georgia TV. And he went to a variety of different places to get experience because Vince had made the decision that on, that's why he told Billy Graham and this sent Billy Graham into turmoil and he got hooked on shit and fucking depression and out of the business because he was the hottest heel in the business and the WWF champion and selling out Madison Square Garden and Philadelphia and everywhere else. But he still had to drop the title on the same date that Vince Sr. had told him he was going to drop it when he won it a year and two months previously to Bob Backlund. Because that was the decision that was made. And I'll say one more thing and then chime in. I heard from... Well, George the Animal Steel told me, but he told me in front of Jack Lanza. And both those guys were around and both those guys would have known and Jack would have rolled his eyes if it wasn't the case that Vince Sr. and Bruno and probably Gorilla, whoever the inner circle was, was at the, the steakhouse for dinner after a garden show one night, their tradition. And... Bruno made the comment to Vince Sr. that there was no way that he was going to get Bob Backlund over in that spot. And Vince Sr. was like, oh, you don't think so. And it was a grudge push at that point to get Backlund over. And that's why even when he won the title, they always had Andre underneath, or they always had Dusty in a special appearance underneath, or they always had Moscaris, or they loaded up the cards with other shit, brought Bruno back for special occasions to bolster Backlund's run because he Although he, he doesn't get the credit he, he doesn't get the credit he deserves for being a big draw. He, he really he, he was a, he was a draw because I mean even the position he was in and he was a draw even though the cards were loaded but that was the first backlash of not just smart fans, but just old time wrestling fans yeah. that because Backlund's took five years. Backlund's work just didn't get good. And and Bob, because he was such a nice guy and the howdy doody farm hand look, he got heat. They wanted the flair, they wanted the dusty, they wanted the personality. When Vince Sr. went to an All-American boy, he went to the... And I love Bob Backlund. And as a heel, Mr. Backlund, he he got it. And that shit was great. He's a psychopath. But the babyface champion Bob Backlund was as bland as fucking non-sugared oatmeal. And people started turning on it. Go ahead. Yes, however... And he gets a lot of the blame for this. Backlund was super over. And Backlund was a reason people were going to the garden... I'm not going to say as much as Bruno, and Bruno wasn't on all those shows, but I know people who were going to those shows who were casual fans that were like friends with my dad, and it was always, had to go see Bob Backlund. It was also, I had to see Dusty Rhodes, but it was, I had to see Bob Backlund. Yeah. And there are other people like that, where things turned on Backlund. It wasn't, they wanted Flair or Dusty. No, they wanted Jimmy Snuka. 
And what happened was with well, and, and okay, and, and hold on, and I say they want they wanted a personality. They wanted a they wanted somebody that was more over the top instead of goody goody. I guess is what I was trying to say. He was still having great matches. I mean, look at his matches in eighty one, eighty two. He was having great matches. Him and Adonis, him and Morocco, him and Bob Orton Jr., him and Buddy yeah, but, Rose. But, I mean, they, okay, but but look, Adonis, again, Morocco, Buddy Rose, and who else did you mention? But there weren't fans saying, "Oh, that's all them." You know, that wasn't the mindset then. What happened was... That was part of the art, but go ahead. They got to see Snuka. Yeah. Kung Fu Billy Graham returns and destroys the heavyweight title, leading to Bob Backlund crying on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He gets a crew cut, taking away whatever personality he actually had, and starts wearing a singlet. That's right. Then, then actually, yes, the crew cut made him look like a person doing community service on the highway, and then the singlet made him look like he was 12 years old. Whatever he had, if you go watch Bob, go watch Backlund versus Snooker at the Garden, the cage match, and then watch Backlund a year later. It's a different feeling all around, and the fans reacted differently. And by that point, you saw this guy fucking crying on TV. His promos have been monotone for years. Snooker's cooler. People are coming off the top rope. This is so awesome. That's where he lost it. And then Vince, the story always was that Vince wanted him to turn heel. Dye your hair and I'll turn you heel. Yeah. And Backlund refused because he didn't want his children to see him as a heel. Wasn't that the story? Or his daughter to yeah. see him as a heel? Well, yeah. And just any of the kids to see him as a Because he took it that seriously. And, and you know, because Bob was a nice guy. He is a nice guy. And he took it that seriously. And at the time, he did not want to be a heel. But that's why I said it took him a while. At that initial run, he never got, he got the business later on, 10 years later, when he came back as a heel. And still had found a way to be entertaining and not run the children off. But he legitimately, I've seen him do it. If a kid asked him for an autograph, they had to recite the, the United States presidents in order. If they did that, he would sign their autograph. And, but he, you know, what a character. As, as Mama Cornette used to say in the best use of the term character. Go watch Backlund when he won the belt. Go watch like the first year of his title reign. Not that it was only that, but specifically that. No suntan or anything, but he's in better shape than almost any wrestler in history. He's in shape like yeah. those fucking pictures you see of George Hackenschmidt at the beginning of the century. <laughs> All pure muscle. He's in the best shape there. He's almost like Brock Lesnar, but natural. He's gigantic. Yeah. And you wouldn't even realize it because it doesn't stand out so much, but he's in amazing shape. But so back to our question. So if uh, if Dusty had beaten Billy Graham in the Garden in 1977, well, then obviously well, there wouldn't have been heat with Eddie Graham because Eddie Graham was probably the NWA promoter that Vince McMahon Sr. would get in contact with more than anybody else in terms of asking for advice or just uh, whatever the case because there was already that relationship. And... I can see Vince Sr. sitting there going, oh my God, this guy's to be the champion. But Vince, or Vince Jr. sitting there saying that, and Vince Sr. saying, well, I've got my plan. I want an all-American boy. We're going to try that for the first time. And, you know, in Dusty's gimmicky, we've got G Billy Graham's a gimmick, Dusty's gimmicky. I can see the generations thinking that. And that would have really been the only other move from going... From the ethnic champions to Backland, which was free of that, would have been going from the ethnic champions to a gimmick. And at the same time, everybody in the NWA, Flair was on their radar, but Dusty was on their radar better. Dusty would end up, you know, he, Flair was still in the Carolinas in 77 and starting to branch out to St. Louis. People knew that they had something there, but Dusty was already main event in the garden, baby. He was already leaving Florida. He was already on TBS. So Dusty had just a year or two edge there in terms of, do you know this guy's going to be the next big star? So they were already planning to give it to Dusty at some point. Well, the other... And, okay. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say the other interesting thing is just evaluating what it really would have meant. If Dusty becomes the WWF champion... Vince Sr. is going to insist on controlling his bookings. Yeah. Would he still want to book Dusty out to various places? Because even then, Dusty was going all over the place. Now, Vince Sr. was the person who booked Dusty to New Japan, right? So, I mean, that relationship would end up building anyway. And Dusty still hadn't booked. 
So he doesn't have that well, really in his blood yet. Well, but no, it was worse because he hadn't done it yet. Well, yeah, I guess so. See, I that's guess so. that's the thing is, you know that Dusty Rhodes probably would never have been the booker for the WWF. A WWF back in those days, they didn't. The, again, that was another way that they operated differently than the other territories. They kept everything in house, and. I obviously I know how it's been since Vince Jr. took over. I wasn't there with Vince Sr., but it was still the group of Skoland and Gorilla Monsoon and his, Vince Sr.'s inner circle. They didn't hire outside wrestlers to come in and be the booker for a period of time like most of the other territories did. So Dusty would not have got that opportunity, but in Florida, learning from Eddie Graham, well, you don't think that that even in 1977, Dusty Rhodes, after having been the top guy and the biggest draw in Florida for four years at that point, is thinking he's going to book that thing one of these days, and he's learning from Eddie Graham being his right-hand man, one of the movers and shakers in the NWA. He knew he was in line for the NWA title, and if he stayed there and stayed close, he'd get more chances to do that. And Dusty... Well, yeah, if I wanted to, uh, had visions of or thoughts of someday I could be the booker here in the Carolinas for Jim Crockett when I was working for Dusty, then you know that he had thoughts that he was already going to be the booker for Eddie Graham when he was the top guy in Florida, even before he did it. So that's the big thing, I think, is that he got to, he got to book in Florida and then that opened the door for Crockett and that was where Dusty was more comfortable being the creative force behind Vince's competition than being Vince's top star. And Dusty made more money as NWA world champion and or Crockett's booker than he probably in 1980, three, four, five, six, than he would have made even being Vince's champion in 77, eight, nine, because he wouldn't have got Bruno's deal. And the business had gotten bigger. Would so Dusty would Dusty have enjoyed living in the Northeast yeah. at that time for three years, four years? Because yeah. that was the other thing. I would assume, no matter who it was, if it was Backland, we saw what happened, other than the Anoki thing, or a gimmick, whoever they were putting a belt on, they wanted the belt to stay on that person for a while. Yeah, and and Bob lived up at, in Connecticut and still does, I guess. And he just was happy there. And there were some people that, that moved there, worked for the WWF, and were so happy they stayed there. Tony Gurria bought him a place up in Hamden, Connecticut. And the other times, you couldn't wait to get the fuck out of there. That's what Jerry Jarrett, you know, was like, fuck, I'm drinking two bottles of wine a night sitting in this condo they've got me in Stamford. I need to get the fuck out of here and back home. So it, they either... Loved it or hated it, one or the other. But so, yes, Dusty would have still got runs with the NWA title. It probably wouldn't have hurt Florida because, let's face it, Florida under Eddie Graham, with Dusty or without Dusty, was always going to be a premier territory because there was so much other talent, so much history, so much television blanketing the state, and Eddie Graham knew what he was doing. There was never periods of time where people were starving in Florida there would have been no problem with the relationship with the NWA because at that time everybody was involved. That's why the WWWF champion was billed as WWWF champion instead of world champion because they had rejoined the NWA just as a show of fellowship, even though they were a separate promotion. So I think, to be honest with you, it would have been a couple of years of fucking great promos and... Can you imagine Dusty's whole shtick when he was still so young and in great shape and wearing the psychedelic fur robes in New York City? And him and Graham would have probably done sellout after sellout, maybe switching the thing back and forth if they'd have gone that far. Well, a few things. One, you know, in Andy Warhol's diaries, there is a mention of hanging out one night with Dusty Rhodes and a I don't know if he really mixed well with Andy Warhol and his crew, <laughs> but I imagine he may have been in his fur coat. I got to go back and check it. It's in the book. 
But the other thing is with Billy Graham, you know, to go to that argument, the idea that the fans were ready to turn him, in a lot of cases they were already cheering him, all they had to do was make him a babyface, you would have been set up. Would those fans have liked babyface Billy Graham matches? He got away with a lot in terms of what he could do in the ring because he was a heel. And the other thing is, who's to say he wouldn't have still had any of the issues in terms of chemical dependence or physical issues that he would end up having in the next few years anyway? Well, I mean, you know, he would have... Graham deteriorated physically after that run significantly over the next few years. And like you're right, especially because of the charisma, he could get by with a few things, but the work in the ring was never his thing. Maybe in the early 70s in the, in the AWA, I would like to have seen more of that stuff. But by the time he lost the WWF, because I mean, <laughs> even Jerry Lawler did not have a great match with superstar Billy Graham because Graham was somebody that w had such a name that you couldn't just tell him what to do. He had to work it out. And, and you know, so Lawler didn't have full control of the match. And the stuff Graham was doing by that point, it just, it, a lot of it you couldn't salvage. But, I think they would have liked him because, again, probably New York still at that time, that territory, that part of the country, what happened in the ring was less important than anywhere else. And Graham was so over. I think they could have switched him babyface and got a tremendous run out of him. After he lost the belt, they still could have switched him babyface and had a big run if he'd have... If they'd have wanted to, if he'd have wanted to, of you know, whatever the fuck happened. But it was just boom and it's over. Yeah, that would have been and perfect. Then you would have had babyface Billy Graham on the show without the belt and you could still have Macklin with the belt. Or if they'd have done it with Dusty. And then can you imagine a special tag team of Dusty Rhodes and Billy Graham, baby, against whatever heel team? That would have been... Against Tom Shaft and whoever else is offended they stole his promo. Oh, come on now. <laughs> Troy Graham will have to be in there, too, because he, he idolized Tom Shaft. And by the way, no relation. Troy Graham, no relation to the other Grahams. But isn't that funny also? Dr. Jerry and Eddie Graham were the biggest heel team in the 50s version of New York wrestling. Eddie came back, or Jerry came back with Luke, and they were a top team. But then they couldn't tolerate Jerry anymore. And then Billy Graham ends up as one of the dominant heavyweight champions, and he's allegedly from the same family. And Vince and Eddie Graham continued a relationship, uh, Vince Sr. So the Grahams were some of the most important people in New York wrestling history, and nobody even really puts that together. You know what? Because we've been talking about this a while, and we still have a lot of things to talk about, and this is a great topic. This has been a lot of fun. Next week's show, let's talk about what if Dusty had been the pick instead of Hogan? What if Hogan had said no? Or what if Vince Jr. had just said, you know what? I know Dusty better. I have a better relationship. He gets it. I'm going to go with him. How does everything change if Dusty is the one that Vince Jr. goes with to beat the Iron Sheik? Wow. If it is because the Iron Sheik, do you use the Iron Sheik at that point? Well, you couldn't have Dusty beat Bob Backlund. No, it would have to be a transition yeah. champion. but. You also had Ivan Koloff and the mass Superstar there. And that's probably, he said, well, I don't want to fucking beat the Superstar or beat Ivan that quick and et cetera, but Sheik can handle it because the better, the short, shorter his match is, the better anyway. But that's, uh, again, these what ifs, they're fascinating because you never know what's going to happen, Brian. You never know what, you could have to change your career in the twinkling of an eye. Just reroute and re-rack your whole life plan. And what, what if Bob Backlund had not become the champion with his academic background? Could he have gotten a job in the real world? Or would if he have had to go and study something to have something to fall back on? What if some of these other people hadn't been picked to, to do these things? Would they have to go study something to fall, or would they have already done it so they already had their fallback plan? These are things we've all got to think about, aren't they, Brian? I guess so, and I would think if Bob Backlund was learning the skill, he may be doing the Harvard step test in the midst of it. Well, yes, and since he would do that for hours at a time, 
he could either read his book or now with all the modern technology, he could look at his phone and he could take these courses. And, you know, folks, I'm telling you, you got to have. I love the idea he's using modern technology, but you're not. Well, I don't need to learn nothing new. I was doing the shit that I used to do profitably. But I'll tell you, folks, if if you're broker than a broke dick dog, if you don't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of, if you're so broke, you can't pay attention. And if you're having, currently having your sweat repossessed because you don't have no money, well, you need a new career. And we've talked about these people. The best way to change your career in today's fast-changing world, one of the best ways to succeed in it, learn how to code. Not only read codes and write codes, but encode things. We've talked about the, the potential for survival. When the lizard people take over the world oh, and the on. bots are doing their bidding. You got to know how to program these bots. Because I'll tell you what, there's no bot about it. These bots are where it's at. <laughs> you're All you're hearing about now is the bots. So if you can't get in the window replacement business and make a fortune, well, you got to go to Code Academy. And over 50 million people already know that. They know they have found out that Code Academy is the best way to learn to code. That's why I say we're going to have to be eliminating some of these people because they're, there's too many people now that are smartened up to this code. But they need more people all the time to learn how to write code that can fool the people that already know how to read secret code. That's why that Code Academy has an endless supply of people to choose from to train in these coding skills. And then they go out there and they do it for a while and then they outlive their usefulness and something happens to them. We got more people <laughs> writing new codes that nobody knows how to read. I give up. I... Folks, <laughs> if you think finding the right career or job can impact your life or possibly save your life, or if you want to know how learning technical skills could be the answer for people quitting as part of the great resignation, I'll tell you what, I've seen people walking down the street here lately. I look out the window, I see some of the people in the human race, and they all look resigned. They all look like they're just resigned to whatever fate has brought them. But no, you can change your future and possibly extend it. Get on the right side of the upcoming takeover. Learn at your own pace. <laughs> and get qualified for in-demand jobs when the world is being rebuilt. I, if you, if There's two things that's going to happen with these modern technology and the artificial intelligence. The world is going to need to be rebuilt and repopulated. So if you don't think that you're up for the repopulating, then you got to be up for the rebuilding. That's where the coding and the basic websites and artificial intelligence and all that stuff, that's where it comes in is the rebuilding. Any any dipshit with a dick can repopulate. But the rebuilding is where the profitableness is going to come in. I don't this think this has nothing to do with well, with Code Academy. Well, I, yeah, it does, because I don't think you're going to get a lot of people that are going to get a lot of money for helping repopulate the world. That's usually something that people are going to do for free. But if you want to rebuild it, because as we know, any jackass can kick the world down, but it takes a carpenter to build one. If you want to rebuild the world, Code Academy can point you in the right direction where you learned from anything from building basic websites to the artificial intelligence. We know what that's code for the bots and everything else you could want. You'll be writing real working code in minutes. Nobody will be able to read it, but you'll be fucking writing it and learning coding languages like the Python, the Hitomosis, the SQL, the JavaScript, and so much more. And of course there's that, personality quiz that you can take there at codecademy.com and you'll get tailored career advice and course recommendations you'll also get some some of the people that read these personality quizzes like to kibitz on things you could do to change yourself to maybe get laid more often or have more friends they'll give you some recommendations on that like shut up or shave your balls shit like that but they will be positive feedback no, they will focus on the coding that you'll be learning and you should all focus on that part of everything that Jim is saying. You will learn a new skill. Yes. A skill called coding. You'll be able to yes. code and build websites. And yes. then there's also all this other fun stuff Jim's talking about, but let's focus on what you really will be learning. And well, yes, you'll capable. learn a lot of things about yourself. They'll tell you what's wrong with you in a heartbeat. 
Folks, build your portfolio and get a certificate of completion to make yourself more marketable to future employers should people like that exist in the future dystopian society. You can land your dream job in web development, programming, computer science, data science, and tons more, including living off the land and turning pond water into drinkable sustenance potable to the average human. Folks, join the over 50 million people learning to code with Codecademy and see where coding can take you, and you can get 15% off your Codecademy Pro membership when you go to Codecademy.com and use the promo code EXPERIENCE. That's promo code EXPERIENCE at Codecademy.com. 15% off Codecademy Pro. That is C-O-D-E-C-A-D-E-M-Y.com. Promo code EXPERIENCE.